process is going to be that the four people will speak in turn for five minutes each, and then my mate Brian will be the first person to ask a question or a comment because he's my mate and he won't take me drinking if I don't give him the first question. So, um, and then it's just a, a conversation with just more people than with most conversations. So. so Western thought. This morning I read a, a paper by two Macquarie University economists on ticket sculpting. And they were explaining that there was nothing unusual about this. It was to do with tickets as they were issued by booking agencies being priced too low and there weren't enough of them. So normal laws of supply and demand create excess demand and therefore the price rise is natural. And I thought to myself, there's actually a rather important moral element here that's missing. I mean, the analysis was clean, clear, perfectly aligned to the classical microeconomic thought, but it deeply missed the point. And so I think we might get around to some of those sorts of conundrums tonight. So we'll start with Andreas and we'll just move in, in order thus. And then Brian will get the first question, remember. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm, I need to say I'm in Australia for my first time and I'm here only for three days and I'm totally fallen in love with uh, this central region without knowing any, any other region but I'm feeling like I really need to, actually I needed to remain uh, here, not fly <laughs> back or come back. Um, and um, so it's a very emotional experience for me and um, that's actually the, the starting point of my short five minute uh, presentation of what my work is about. Um, I'm a biologist and I'm a f also a philosopher and, um, and actually I'm trying to understand um, ourselves as meaningful living subjects among other meaningful living subjects. So I'm trying to um, rethink ecology and biology as, um, as a process of relating and as a process of experiencing this relationship and this exchange with others um, as, um, as an emotional process. And um, this is something which I I was always after, actually, already when I was a child or an adolescent. And I will just tell you one short story to show you how um, maybe um, that, that can also illustrate how why I'm um, so fascinated by a region in which people for many tens of thousands of years were um, relating to the land as a means to gain identity and because I, I tried to do this when I was a teenager. I was one of these teenagers who didn't um, buy mopeds and who didn't have a lover. I had a vegetable garden and a small pond um, <laughs> in the fields in, in the north of Hamburg, the, the, the German town of Hamburg, so in a rather northern region with, a, with strong winters, severe winters compared to here. and. Um, I was in love with amphibians and I tried to, <coughs> to find them and I spent long days in springtime lying on my belly and staring into the water because I, I, was, I was trying to spot a newt, which is the, for everybody who doesn't know, it's not a frog or a toad, it's the, the, the animal with a tail, the, 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 the aquatic salamander. This was for me the fairy animal. And then one day I saw one, which went up slowly to to take in some air at the surface and then went down and, and I stared at this animal and this animal somehow didn't stare at me but it was, I was caught in, in his gaze and I had this, the, the deep experience that this other living being there in whose life I happened to be because I was so um, eager to connect um, was something about myself as a living and feeling being trying to make my living and trying to relate with others. So in a way I woke up in this gaze, in, this, in these dark eyes who were, uh, who, were, who were, who didn't have a bottom. I fell into these eyes and um, 
And from that point, I started to understand what it is that um, so intensely connects people to otherness, to other beings, to the landscape, to the material surroundings. Um, and to my eyes, um, this is a very, it's a very, I, I need to keep it short because I'm already running out of time, but to my eyes, most people know this, most people have some biophilic tendencies, many people um, enjoy themselves in what we call nature, but which is actually a, an assemblage of other subjects with whom we can connect because they are like ourselves. And to me, um, this finding myself in the presence of others with whom I am able to exchange aspects of my selfhood um, is the basic process of identity which um, I undergo as a living being. So it's a kind of inner experience of our ecological <coughs> relationships which are about exchange of matter and of stuff to, um, to live and to, um, to have offspring and to carry on. This is always a transformation and an exchange process. And we can experience this from the inside and we can see that others also experience this, this from the inside. And this gives, gives a huge expressive cosmos of relationship um, or of aliveness from the inside. So, so that's my, that is my, my let's say, in, in, in very short form, my philosophical project, which in, in some respect is the attempt, and that's very European, to update romantic thinking with um, insights from biology and from psychology and from personal lived experience, but which is on the other <coughs> hand, um, and that's why, why I'm so fascinated to be here, only if I'm only I'm so, sh so here for such a short time. On the other hand, it is, um, it is a way, a very ancient way of understanding that we are this earth, we are these bodies, we are this whole of which we are a part, and because we're a part, we are yearn to relate with this. So it is about identity, actually. And, um, and to my eyes, and that's when I will stop it, to my eyes, this is um, as the title of this panel goes, this is where Western thought has gone wrong in a deep way. Um, we have uncoupled our striving or our making of identities from body and from others and from the space, from the desiring space we are living in, so that we are completely alone and only in our head when it comes to identity. Um, but it's there, it's always there, and we even have a feeling for it, and I think what we need to do um, is to, to do, to do archaeological work to trace these connections which we can do from our first person perspective, I, as I did as an adolescent with this nude, and which to my eyes, if I don't get it completely wrong, in a very conceptual way that people who have, li have been living here for 80,000 years have been doing in a, very, in a very complicated and a very elaborate and very poetic um, cosmological system. So to me, um, there, there, is, there is work to be done to, 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 to get back our identity as a, living, um, as a living part of a living whole. Well, that's for my work. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you. much. Where are you going? <laughs> as the second guest, yes. Um, um, I'm an art historian from Berlin, uh, not a philosopher, um, and in fact, um, my work, my beginning in my ac academic career, I also was um, very concerned with um, nature and shifts in depiction and the shifts in underlying understanding which um, determined the different ways that artists have um, have. have have shown um, a landscape, landscape already as a as a man-made feature, translated into art. Um, and since Andrea has now started so very personally, um, I perhaps just connect to that. Um, when one comes to a country like I do for the first time, a country where the landscape and nature is so very different, one has one instinct that everybody, I think, does. It's actually an instinct which drives the whole of art history, I would say. 
one constantly compares and contrasts. One draws on similar experience and then finds things that are alien. And that's a very natural uh, process. But in the end, I think it, draw, it, it throws us back onto our own uh, reflection, onto our own being and what we've become. Um, and it, for me, this is the process in going back into history and actually reflecting on the moment when um, what we now hear on this panel term Western thought um, has actually come about. It wasn't always there. And it is a question of when changes happened. And let me just focus on two instances, which I think I mean, it would be a huge story to tell. And all of us would tell it probably slightly differently. But I thought that two instances might um, um, perhaps draw out aspects that, to me, seem central in explaining where I contrast what I see and where I compare. Um, I have a problem with, to start with, with the, um, with the concept of Western thought, because I don't really know what this is. It's not clearly, particularly in Australia, it's a bewildering concept, because um, what we consider to be the West, you know, obviously the United States is to the East here, and what we used to think as the East in Europe um, is clearly now something, you know, China, India, what we now would also consider as being part of Western thought um, in some way or another. Um, and I guess what we really mean is industrialization. And the moment when um, industrialization took off in Europe, the first country was, of course, Great Britain in the 18th century. And that is also the moment when Great Britain started really to colonize this country. So it's the moment of industrialization, I think, which is really at stake. And that's been a long process in Europe. And um, several aspects, I guess, um, played a role for it to take off in the first place. Um, and one which I might want to highlight, I want to highlight because I'm an art historian with a description of a picture, um, is a different way of thinking about creation, nature, and the role of God and religion. Um, and the picture I have in mind is a very famous picture by a very famous artist, the Italian Renaissance artist Titian, who was hugely probably the most successful artist of the time in the 16th century. And by the end of his life, he painted a painting which is shocking to anybody who, um, who knows Titian's paintings well, um, where um, he tackled a myth, an ancient myth, um, but turned it upside down because at stake for him was a new concept of nature that was just about to emerge at his time and which he couldn't engage with anymore, any longer. He, it was new and he criticized it and he did it with this myth. And the myth is um, Apollo slaying Marcius, um, a half-god who dared um, to challenge him um, um, to a contest between instruments. Apollo is the god of um, reason and divine harmony, and his instrument is the lyre, um, you know, modern day, or well, uh, uh, ancient violin, you know, a celestial instrument to which one could also sing, and words played a role. Reason is, um, you know, connected to words. And Marcius challenged him with the earthen um, flute. Uh, he's an earthen cre cre creature. And what's at stake in this myth is clearly sort of reason against um, earthly being and nature against uh, mind and so on. Um, and um, traditionally, this myth is depicted by um, um, Apollo looking on as Marcia you know, the punishment for Marcia is, is that he is skinned alive, and that is depicted in the history of art in, in Europe. Um, and normally, of course, because he is a divine god, he just looks on. And Titian paints him doing the slaying himself and penetrating deep into the body. And in that way, he depicts Apollo as what is just emerging in, well, natural history at his time, which is an anatomy, going deep down into the body. <coughs> And um, in the picture, Titian opposes this by his own understanding of how we should approach, or he wanted to approach nature, 
um, simply by observation, not by penetration, but by observation. And he does it um, uh, in a very complicated way in that he seals over this, the body of Marcias by paint marks, which look to us almost impressionistic. You know, lots of different marks which flimmer and glimmer and um, withdraw physicality. And he draws this back into nature and opposes two concepts of understanding our surrounding, the environment, our existence. And in fact, you know, it's a it's a, it's a very, very brutal and violent comment um, on a new order. But it took 200 years um, in Europe for this new understanding of what natural science can do, penetrating nature, understanding pin principles, working by experiment rather than observation, to really talk hold. And this is my second moment. I jump into the 18th century where natural history um, finally manages it's a long process um, to upstage um, a different account of how the world comes into being, which is um, religion. Christianity has the creation. It's in the six, it's in six days, and it's God's creation. And that is also in Titian's um, painting, of course, the sacred ground which can't be violated because it's a godly, a divine creation. And we shouldn't, you know, um, violate it by penetrating it and trying to understand its principles. We can only understand what is revealed to us um, as it is um, uh, apparent in our senses. That's Titian's position. In the 18th century, and I guess the, the crucial point is the um, uh, um, is um, Jean, um, Georges um, Henri uh, Leclerc, um, better known as Count de Buffon, who published in mid-century, just in the run-up to the um, to the to, well, it's the Enlightenment and the run-up to the French Revolution, um, a treatise um, in which he um, um, shows it's a treatise, or it's a, it's actually a couple of books uh, where he shows that uh, he can explain creation simply. Um, by uh, drawing on physical um, laws that can still be observed today. It doesn't need God's hand in order to be explained. So this is the first volume of, um, of his natural history, hugely popular at the time. Um, but uh, you know, a change in um, natural understanding and what science can do slightly anachronistic term in the 18th century, it was really more appropriate to the 19th century, but even in natural history, what <coughs> science can do um, is to actually understand and the laws of nature and by thereby bypassing um, uh, religion and divine law and, um, and what you can understand in that way, of course, you can also manipulate. This is an important principle for industrialization to take off. And I guess in the 18th century, then the second principle, and again, you can see this reflected in art, um, is um, the universalization of property rights. Um, previously, really, in Europe, there was a lot of common ground. Um, um, in, and, and Britain is the first country which completely separates up with enclosures and privatizes every inch of the land. To the day, you can't walk anywhere and not be on private land. Um, um, and that had the consequences that huge numbers of people who existed simply on, you know, gleaning and feeding on common ground um, were suddenly um, thrown into poverty, utter poverty. Um, and art reacted to this in two ways, by um, either depicting these people as the deserving poor, which need philanthropy and charity to look after them, or um, by showing them as loitering and trespassing and therefore you know, not deserving um, uh, care and charity but punishment instead. And I guess that is a dilemma which emerges in, 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 in the 18th century shortly or just on the verge of industrialization taking off, which I guess is still an issue or at least this is you know, the comparison, which is still a dilemma we are dealing with um, when we think about people who have lost out in the process of industrialization. I need to stop here. It was much longer than five minutes. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Sorry, Rob. <laughs> OK. OK, that's the visiting team now, the home team back. So <laughs> Kieran starts. That was an incredible sweep of history. Yeah, take some time to process that. 
Um, I think just what I wanted to talk about um, was more an emotional response um, to the natural world um, and ideas around that that have um, been developed in um, arts practice in Central Australia. And I'm look, thinking particularly about um, the theatre project of Craig San Rock called Persephone's Picnic, and in a way um, that unites with um, what uh, Charlotte has talked about because of the way he was concerned with the retelling of a myth and making connections between um, our foundational European culture <coughs> that the settler population has brought to Australia and the resonance that that might have with our under ways of seeing and understanding the land. Um, so I'll just um, read a little because it was quite an elaborate uh, project and it would, you know, I could spend an hour talking about it, but just to give you an idea of where we were and what was involved. Um, it was a community theatre event, not a ticketed event, and it was in the old stone quarry in El Papa Valley. It was very important that we were there in a site of beauty and damage on Aranda country. Um, and the story that he chose to tell was a story of Demeter and Persephone, and the reason why um, has its roots in work that he was doing around the development of farming on Aboriginal land and using the story to um, have a discussion with Aboriginal people about where European agriculture came from, what it's, how its practices developed, and to hear in turn from them about their attitudes towards the land and what they could glean from it. When he brought this work into town and um, involved a sort of gathering, a quite a big gathering of uh, non-Aboriginal people at the stone quarry, he was interested in us tuning in to um, that kind of storytelling as a way to, I guess, re-enchant ourselves with the natural world and reconnect to um, the, that as those aspects in our own cultural heritage and so perhaps better listen to what Aranda people have to say about this country that we're living in. Um, so I... What I re wanted to read, actually, I've, I've written a, a bit about this in essays and some reports for the Alice Springs News and um, an essay for Griffith Review, but um, when I was looking at them and thinking about today, I thought I'd prefer to read what was really a sort of diary note about my personal experience of um, that, because uh, I think it expresses better that idea of... Um, or the way that that experience was an enchanting experience and started to <coughs> make connections. Um, I, uh, one more point, perhaps, is to um, say that there was a particular honouring of women in that project, um, of the mother-daughter pair that is Persephone and uh, Demeter and Persephone, and of women's generative, loving generative power. Um, so, uh, from this personal note, I, I wrote, I felt like I had waited my whole life to see those three young women dancing on the ground that honoured mother and daughter in the world. The world becoming, mother, daughter becoming, intertwined, intuitive, intelligent against the effacements of millennia, a story of beginnings that returns us to the obvious start, the womb of the world. And in Greek mythology, that was Delphi. Flowers springing <coughs> up in the footsteps of Demeter, mountains, valleys, rivers formed by love, which call our love in return. The poetry, its gift of seeing, of listening, 
the sense of world and woman unfolding in tandem with rising intelligence of one another, the birds answering off the cliff face, the magnificent cultural writing in country, that's the phrase of Margaret Kamara Turner. That was in my mind as I watched the smooth skin, shining hair, the arms, the breasts, the smiles, the laughter, the lift of skirts, the light steps of the young women dancing. Latsy's arm raised to the sky, to the birds, showing us the birds who were doing what he knew they would do all his decades in his smile of deep satisfaction. The birds were flying and veering off the cliff in the updraft from the wind. The murmuring of babies, the blue of the ranges in the west as the sun sank, the hazy purple pink of the sky, the grass still pale across the darkening valley. Marvelous spanakopita in my mouth, the gift of food, the generosity and grace <coughs> of them, the girls becoming women who carried it to us. And then we went down into Hades. This is following the story. Where we saw the spectre of all we have to lose, wrought by the poetry, amplified by the flames and black smoke, the destructive power, the worst of ourselves, set loose upon the world. Um, um, what we, in, importantly came out of that too was to then um, look at the damage in the site where we were and to make the connection between the story we were being told about those ancient ways of bringing the earth into being and nurturing the earth um, to contrast it with something that Charlotte has um, just described, you know, the processes of industrialization that have marked our own country and upon which we rely for our very existence with, you know, the supply of everything that we need having to be delivered to us from afar. Um, so making that, those connections with the issues of um, sustainability in this country. Okay, finally, I'll ask Paul, who is the director of the Desert Parkies. Yeah, thanks, Rolf, and um, it's really um, <coughs> great having listened to Andreas and Charlotte, and they're followed up by Karen. Um, it's interesting people coming from afar, visiting um, this great country we have here, and I'm going to talk more specifically about um, Aranda people and, and about this place. Um, the, the heading of this particular format was Responsibility and Humanity and Where Has Western Thought Gone Wrong? So I didn't really prepared anything until I left at the last minute. It was like three o'clock today, I think. I thought I'd put something down on paper. Because I've been living it, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not there, it's there. So I didn't want to overanalyze what I was going to say or um, just let it sort of come out. And it's really great because it's like doing the right songs. It's about just letting it happen, it's letting it flow. So it's a great question, where has Western thought gone wrong? And a great topic to have an engaging discussion. I suppose the question can be where to begin. But like any civilization um, and the culture that's derived from that civilization, there are good elements and there are also not so good elements. Um, what does one choose to discuss in this arena of responsibility and humanity? Um, well, I would like to suggest that um, within a certain demographic and maybe a complete generation, both responsibility and humanity may well have may well be lost. And the ability to recover may well be beyond the capacity and the capability of those that are lost within it. Um, so at a heading of transitioning of a lifestyle contingent on need to an environment driven by greed. Um, so prior to the impact of Western ideology, the peoples who occupied the land had a framework which determined how people related to each other and 
the environment, where responsibilities and obligations were clear and the expectations of achievements were in the limits and of in the realm of possibility. Um, today we have a generation of peoples that are struggling to find space or a niche in which to carve out some semblance of normality in a community which is going full steam ahead. Prior to the introduction of external support for sustenance, where reward for little or no effort has been in a sense a form of intervention, which has forever rendered the people in object poverty and has stripped away at the fabric which has held a continuous living society together. Approaches to thinking that are foreign to what had existed and if not implemented with a good understanding of the intricate web of complexities that make up what is to be replaced, then by its nature can only be seen as an intervention. One can argue that there was never any intent other than of good. However, the outcome has been devastating. A lifestyle contingent, a lifestyle uh, contingent on needs <coughs> that does not co correlate or transition to an environment driven by greed. People have a sense of community and within, an, within this an obligation to contribute to the sustenance and the viability of that community. Through an external intervention to this thinking, the need to contribute becomes less important and the skills and knowledge acquired can be readily become redundant. The ability to transfer these skills and knowledge no longer holds a place of importance or relevance to an audience which is the next generation. A struggle for relevance soon ensures and the sense of hopelessness clouds one's thinking and relief is nowhere to be seen on the horizon and what is beyond is most likely despair. Contribution to a collective experience and the value of it to the individual is paramount to self-worth and the strengthening of the family unit and the broader community. Within this generation, the current environment has provided <coughs> a lack of aspirational thinking beyond what is within the view and the ability to think over the horizon may cause uncomfortableness. Comfortableness. So therefore, a restraining, a restraining of any growth or ideas and solutions. It appears now that individualism is the mantra and many will be able to navigate this path and in its thinking of Western ideology, which has placed ladders in strategic locations, which will only allow for a few to step out of the darkness and into the light, and it could be inversed into the light, out of the light, into the darkness. So, um, you know, my role as director of Alice Smith Desert Park, um, I see a great opportunity for us as a government department to actually return a cultural and social dividend back to the community. I can tell you right now we're turning a financial dividend back into the community. But, um, you know, just reconnecting people to country is what is paramount. And then connecting people back to the rare and endangered species we have there as a repository within our collections and to have those stories, songs, dances, and that relived. My question is how we're going to do it. That's it. Okay. As I, <coughs> excuse me. As I said, Professor Mooney has the first questions or comments. I think. Um, well, I'll, I'll try and uh, draw a few threads together here. Um, it's always difficult when you're asked to speak about a topic that's got to do with failures in Western culture. There is, as you said, Charlotte, no real thing, Welsh, Western culture. There's a, a series of tensions, disagreements, fights um, uh, that give rise to cultural expressions right the way through the, the, the history of things. In art, you know, the... Uh, the Promethean thought of the ancient Greeks led the Promethean kinds of artworks that were produced by the ancient Greeks. What, what I think, uh, the, one of the lessons that we haven't learned or haven't learned well enough uh, from our indigenous brothers and sisters in Australia is that there's, uh, that the relationship between materiality and spirituality is actually very deeply tied together. That there's a sense in which nature is both continuous and discontinuous with the principles, or if you prefer, God or divine beings. And when we look out here and see these wonderful escarpments, these are, th these are arenas within which divine beings play themselves out and still play themselves out. Um, so I see the Western tradition very much as being a series 
of conflicts that, uh, that, that lead to various kinds of cultural expressions. Now, uh, when you were talking about the, the, um, the industrial period and the Enlightenment, the, the, that is directly responded to by the poets and the artists. So for instance, you get Blake's Dark Satanic Mills, which is a description of just how, uh, how rotten this is in regard to the vision of England. Um, and it gets played out in, later on in the reactions of the Romantic uh, painters from you know, up until Van Gogh and, and, and the, the, the return back to nature. But behind all of these things, um, uh, 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 in the Western tradition there, you have um, a kind of platonic synthesis. And the Platonism is the, uh, is the arena that's played itself right the way out through Emanuel Swedenborg, who was so important in the poetic and romantic movements of, the, of, of, of Western Europe, um, which says that there's always a relationship between the principle and its manifestation. They're never completely broken together. So spirit, God, the divine beings, and materiality are all intimately entwined. That's why we paint on rocks. Uh, it's an exercise in, in being part of the creative process of the divinity. And it's also uh, why the only real response is love. Oh. <laughs> okay. Do any of you want to respond to that? No, I think I, um, I would just love, like to endorse that, um, you know, having stopped in the 18th century, one could go on, and um, Brian is quite right, you know. Um, as soon as industrialization sets in, you have a strong counter movement in thought, in culture, um, you know, even in social um, debates. Um, in art, you've mapped it quite rightly. So, Caspar David Friedrich in Germany is the one artist who sees divinity in every aspect of nature. Um, um, and that's just at the moment. Uh, when industrialization sets off in Germany as well. Um, you know, there are always these sort of moves and counter moves, um, which makes it difficult to, um, and perhaps impossible to speak of, um, you know, one pole <coughs> and a counter pole as a corrective or as a, yeah. as, as a deviant. Yes. Yeah, I'd like to add some, something from, from a biological perspective. Thanks a lot um, for this um, echo. Um, what, what, I'm, what I have been trying to do is, um, as a biologist, to um, trace um, the ways in which um, living beings, we ourselves, but also other living beings, um, are um, truly and deeply connected to this otherness you were talking about, like the idea that um, painting on the rock means to participate <coughs> in the process of creation. And um, being in a living body also means to participate in the process of creation and in the process of mutual creation, which is something which um, biology for a long time um, has not um, emphasized. It was always there, but it wasn't um, truly in the picture. Um, um, and just, just to give you an example, um, or maybe two examples, that first, um, every um, ecological reality is always, cons is always made up of relations of mutuality. These can be mu relations of um, one eats the other, but it's also relations of one is there for one for the other, like the flower, which is which is giving life to the insect, and the insect which is influencing through the course of history the way the flower um, manifests as blossom. So the flower imagines the insect, and the insect dreams the flower in a way. So that you can, you can reconceptualize ecology as, as, um, as a participative process, um, which always has an imaginary dimension. And, um, and then there is, even on a deeper level, something which, which is, um, it's very simple, but it's very, to me, it's always very fascinating. Um, 
this comes from my teacher Francisco Varela in, in Paris, um, who, who worked for his lifetime on, 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 the, on, the, on the question, what does a cell do actually? What is life on the cellular level? And um, w it is important to know that w when, when we are living and we are metabolizing, we are in a continuous, um, not only exchange with other, but we are continuously remaking ourselves from the stuff of this world, and we are dissolving into the stuff of this world again. So if you're, um, so this it's, it's plain um, bio, bio, um, biochemistry or, or physiology. If, if you're breathing, um, or if you, you if you're eating, you take up CO, CO carbon in, in 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 carbohydrates or in fats or in whatever proteins. And then in, in met metabolism, this carbon becomes part of your body, which you could show if you show the, the chemical reactions in a cell. And when you are breathing, you're breathing out um, carbon as CO2, and this carbon is your body. So it's not like, like pupils in school might learn that we, we're taking up energy, like f fuel in a motor, and then we are, we are giving up CO2, which is the burned fuel. It's not that, so, but we are, as bodies, and this is what every cell, cell does, we are constituting our identity by um, constructing ourselves from others, and we are we are cons con con we are keeping up our identity by giving up ourselves so that others can take up ourselves. And to me, this is very much um, a, a participatory, imaginative process, which um, which has resemblances to this this act of I need to paint on this rock in order to show that I am, um, I am a part of a creative process, process which includes this rock, but which includes this rock only if I, um, if I point to it. So to my eyes, this is something what, what living beings actually all the time do. And um, this is also something which we can all, always, all the time see when we meet living beings. And to my eyes, in a way, what, what happens to our feeling when we are yearn to get into contact with other living beings as I yearn to get into contact with my sweet nudes at that pond, um, which by, by now has long gone, by the way. Um, it's paved over. Um, it's, 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 it's basically um, nothing else as this artistic process of pointing to being part in creation. That's what we see when, we're living, when we see living beings, when we, when we walk through an ecosystem, when we um, climb up this, these is escarpments. It's, it's, to my eyes, it's just, this is just a basic, um, basic deep experience um, of being alive, which, which we don't have as a center of, our, of, our, of, of what we think what being alive is about. And, and so that's a challenge to get back this, um, this into, into the focus of our thinking. Yeah. Just ask a question. <laughs> I have a question to everybody, but also to my um, fellow panelists. Um, I think what I've heard here is pretty much an agreement um, that um, there's not just one way of conceptualizing nature, thinking about nature, but alternative ways, and I guess. Um, we have made the point uh, that they have not, and you as well, Brian, that they have not been as absent from so-called Western thinking. Um, and if um, I then, so, uh, and, and Kieran um, movingly told uh, us about a project of where love um, would be an important principle to amend a situation gone wrong, and for Paul, if I've understood you rightly, um, you pretty much do not only see doom and gloom at the horizon, you do not see any um, exit from the way, the, the, the motor where we are um, hurtling down at the moment. Um, um, I wonder how much um, conceptualizations of nature are actually central and at stake in a situation which, again, simplifying, um, you know, property rights have been universalized and the financial markets now govern globally. Um, you know, and any attempt um, to 
yield something somewhere is now actually escalating on a vast project. You know, the whole disaster of the climate um, agreement is that globally it needs to be agreed at. So it's at a scale um, where I think um, we are stuck. Um, I wonder if it's sufficient to talk about conceptualization, if the challenges are actually not elsewhere. Could I just, yeah, say something? Um, it's perhaps coming at what you're saying um, from a tangent, but um, that notion of um, damage and repair um, that I think we um, carry strongly um, when we're thinking about, for instance, responding to uh, the whole range of environmental issues that, and including climate change. Um, I was, have just been struck to listen to, um, I, I mentioned her earlier, Margaret Kamara Turner, when she talks about country um, by um, a sort of a very strong sense of continuity um, which seems to describe um, a field of forever future <coughs> possible action that we can undertake rather than things being destroyed or it all being too late. And um, there was a forum uh, in town uh, about a decade ago now where uh, we were talking about urban planning. Um, and she was being asked to comment on the centre of town and her answer didn't make any mention of any built surface. Um, what she had to say was that the old tree is still standing. Well, thank goodness it is. Um, so this is the massive red river gum sacred to the Arenta that's in the middle of the mall that most of you would know. So she called it the foundation tree which represents all of the people of this place. And she talked about the other Red River Gums that are surviving in the centre of town. Um, and she was asked whether she could still feel the energy of the land underneath all of the concrete, the buildings and so on. And she said, yes, the foundation is still there here. That's how people see it. So how she and Arunda people see it. And is there a way to bring that out, she was asked, a way to make it visible? And she said it can be thrown, shown through the trees, the plants, the fruits. And she mentioned the town area was once particularly good for finding yucca, wild onion. And it can be shown through art. And I think everyone listening to her felt tremendously consoled, um, but also, uh, I think, heartened of, by that possible action that we can take that is responsive to that and that can honour that continuity that, and, um, that is hopeful. So. Mike. Um. <coughs> Thanks, Kieran. Um, MK is a great friend of so many of us, and I was just reading her book before my time. Uh, she's written this marvellous book called The Awenajoucha, What It Means to Be an Aboriginal Person. And uh, I've read it many times. But what you just said about the tree, she also says it in, she takes it even further, she says that the connection between people are like roots, that they go deep down in the earth, and she calls it a and the roots all go out and they connect. Everything underneath the ground is like, she says, like a wire, like a telephone wire that's spreading out all through the earth. And everything is touching everything else. So her idea is what yours was, Andrea, sort of connection, relationship. She says, when she describes herself, she says, I'm Kamala. So she puts herself in the middle of an eight skin network of kin. And then she says, a kurtaranya from a place. So she's born of the spirit of a place from her grandfather's country. And she is 
born into a relationship, a connection of every person in her known world. And every person in every place is connected to each other. So if you want to find out what the other in the world is all about, go to M.K. Turner. And, uh, and you, she's got it, she encapsulates it all. Right. Yeah, just, just, just let me connect what you say and also what I said before with what you said, and, um, which, which I think is utterly important. When you t we're talking about the shift from a world in which there was a commons, which was um, accessible by all and which was for all, into a world in which, which has been enclosed and appropriated, which was a historical process, actually. <laughs> Um, and uh, which was which uh, enclosure of the commons, so, so um, denying people who are living with the land and make a livelihood of the land this right and, and um, shifting them to the city so they become the, the, the urban poor is a, is a historical process in Europe, but it is also the process of colonialization. That's the same thing. And... Um, and we have been talking, um, uh, at least I understand what's what um, um, Turner has been talking is about um, the relationship of society in, in itself and to, and to the place as a commons, which you can also feel. You feel this commons. And um, what I try to understand is an ecosystem as a commons. To my eyes, an ecosystem is a commons because it is about mutual transformation um, which, which is needed to be a whole which sustains itself and which then can nourishes the individuals who, who nevertheless need to nourish the whole also. So this is, it's a very complicated system of mutual relationships. Um, um, and um, this plays down in, in societies who respect this or in, in, in behavior which respects this to um, a, a conceptualization of human relationships and human otherness relationships in terms of commons. So it means, it means I, um, I give you life, which then gives me life. To my eyes, that's the principle of ecology, and that's the principle of commons, and that's the principle of love. That's the principle of love. I want you to be, and this makes me alive. And so a commons has an interior dimension. It has an, an, an experience dimension and, 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 a, and a dimension we can feel. And this is, to my eyes, this is what we do all the time when, when we are out there. And this is what we do right, right now here when we're talking with one another. And at some point in, in history, um, this stopped because some people had a different concept which was very much about getting richer. And it just... Um, the, the, the leading idea was um, there is nothing such as um, a, a mutual transformation uh, which is also inwardness, but it's, it's about um, um, being um, separated, being more efficient, um, using others, so getting away from, from transformation to, um, to uh, exhaustion, to separation. And, uh, um, so it's th th this whole complex of what you could call um, bioliberalism or, or whatnot. So this, which which forms um, which forms economic theory, but which forms also the mainstream of biological theory, because it's only about the idea of competition. It's not about the idea of mutual transformation, and it's not about inwardness. I I was so frustrated when I started to study biology that it was all only about. Um, managing lives in an efficient way and there was nothing um, about beauty and about experience and about myself in this. And it ha this has to do with denying ourselves the reality of being part of a commons, which, which we are. And, um, and I mean, I, I, had even, I was thinking today that the disaster of the, the Aboriginal culture here um, reflects in a, in, a very tr in a tragic and bitter way the disaster of the thought which, um, which, which, which thinks, which believes that we can separate a commons and we can go on living in separating the ties which are needed to, to always recreate ourselves. So in a way, it's what, what we're seeing there, when, we, when we're seeing the misery of these people, it's our own misery and it's our own tragedy and it's our own failure. It's a mirror, actually. And we, we don't even get this as, a, as the dominant society or, or how, whatever you would call it. 
So, so just 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 to finish, I think this this the your idea you brought up with um, the, the, the t t that we need to see that the, what what that the big decisive um, jump or switch was that we 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 gave up the, our ideas of life as a commons is the, the decisive moment when truly something went wrong. And to my eyes, ro the romantic movement was a way to reestablish this idea, which in itself then went wrong again and again and again. Yeah, that's it. There's an inscription uh, on a temple in ancient Egypt from the third millennium. It's called the, uh, it's, it's become known as the Song of the Harper. That just brought your things. It's a time of troubles. The kingdom starts to split up. And he says, no one believes in the gods anymore. No one has good relationships anymore. And everybody's greedy. <laughs> so, it's the same story. <laughs> Um. Um, I've got a question, um, and it's about, uh, I guess, the local, you know, I was speaking to um, a Scottish artist friend of mine who was talking about the enclosures movement, and I was really struck with the similarity of what happened when they, um, you know, went into those remote Scottish islands and moved people off the land in order that they could uh, have agriculture there. Um, and the policies, are, you know, if you look into it, just mirror what has happened in Australia. Um, and she had, she, in her work, talks about this connection to the land. And she talks about that not only did they sever people's connection to land, but they severed the connection of the psyche to land and the very local rules governing structures that enabled us to understand our connection to land. And for her, this connection is local. And then I think about a globalised world, um, and then the extreme opposite of that is the kind of thing that you have in central, in you know, the interior of Australia, of fly-in, fly-out culture, where you have people fly in, they do a shift, um, pr pulling things out of the ground to send them off to elsewhere, overseas, for consumption to fuel, um, you know, this hyper-industrial world we have now. Um, and I'm interested in hearing reflections on that, particularly from Paul, because you're someone who, you know, has been here for a long time, and your perspective on this, you know, particularly in the territory, we come and we go. We, you know. I'm from a settler family that's been here for a long time, but only a short time. And every, there's this common thing in Alice Springs and the Territory where everyone's always talking about leaving. And, and what impact does this have on us, on our ability to connect with the natural world? And how do we, yeah, what do we learn from this? I think everyone's got an ability to connect mm. with nature. I think it's a, about allowing yourself to connect and providing the space and the, um, the time to actually look at how we can connect as individuals. Um, you know, with Aboriginal culture and Aboriginal people, you know, they don't go very far away from where they come from. And the connections are always deeply rooted, as um, Mike was saying about uh, MK talking about the roots of the tree and everybody's connected. Um, m my fear is that, you know, we have a continual intervention, but it's external intervention. Um, I just hope there's some internal intervention. Um, and that internal intervention has to come through a, cult, a, a cultural connectivity bigger than what's going on now. I don't know the, the answers, but I have um, great hope. I'm not completely doom and gloom, <laughs> you know. Um, so, you know, I think it's a, it's a work in progress. Um, and I think there's a lot of things on the peripheral that need to be fixed first. And then I think you'll see a really great contribution from Aboriginal people. I'll, I'll be naughty and make an observation. I'm not supposed to. I've been under strict instructions to say nothing. <laughs> um, FIFO is a, again, using this notion that I introduced early, there's a rational Western thought and then something else happens and, and yet we're required to bring different kinds of judgments to it. Um, and so FIFO is a, a classic example of mutual advantage, right? If I'm going to build a big mine somewhere in the middle of nowhere um, and I want skilled white fellas to come and work it, um, they don't want to leave Perth where their families are, where all the facilities that they value, like Woolworths. Um, 
are. So um, they prefer to live in a city where there's lots of potential employers, not one. I've known people who grew up in one company mining towns, and I can tell you, it's better to live in a hundred company mining town than a one company mining town. So there's that avoidance of exploitation, if you like, manifest by the market creating very high salaries. You know, we've all heard the stories of cleaners being paid 120 or 150 thousand dollars a year. Um, that's a classic case, if you like, from the rational Western point of view of of the imbalance between resources and, and, and design. This, if you like, the galloping industrialisation creates its own impetus. So from the mining company's point of view, fly, FIFO is a good idea. A, because you can get lots of skilled workers. Um, they're not going to want to live in the desert, right, because we white fellas don't like the desert. Or we, they're not going to... This is not a, a particular problem of, of Australia. This is a problem of the northern the high latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere. You know, I've been in Yellowknife and the topic of conversation in the bar where I spent a fair bit of time one night was the turnover of the white fellas in the town. Now, let me give you another example. Let's go back to 23,000 to 18,000 years ago in this part of the world. It was horrendous. Gale, perpetual gale force winds Te average temperatures about eight degrees lower than this. I mean, the, f the winds were so strong they created the dune fields of the Simpson Desert and also about 80 metres of west central Australian mud in the middle of the ta Tasman Sea. People survived here. They survived by employing uh, a pulse and pause strategy, if you like. So they would try and stay at permanent water holes, and there are some of them within sighting, easy sighting distance of here. Um, and then if there was a, some rain, they would spread out. Now it's exactly the same strategy as the kangaroo or other animals that require reasonable amounts of water. So wh what are we to make of that? Because the, the people made something very different I mean, from, what, from what the kangaroo did. But the kangaroo was part of, if you like, in their intrinsic system. I mean, you talk about landscapes in Europe. People are painting what they see. But Aboriginal landscape, these dot paintings, they're landscapes, we accept they're bird's eye view landscapes. But they're painting by what the people know about the country. Um, so it's a different, different philosophy and it's very difficult. You know, you see it every day in, in the way that the real inhabitants of Central Australia and us migrants, um, how we relate to the place. Now, over time, as we get older, we start to imbue, you know, I mean, for instance, from my office upstairs, I can see from Emily's Gap to, to Mount Gillen. It's profoundly a, a great view, a million dollar view. Did you put us up there? Yeah, but that, that sort of, you know, the... <laughs> can I just... <laughs> Do you know, it's extremely difficult to paint what you see. Um, it, you know, I, this is actually my doctoral thesis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but you, People always your, imbue what they see with what artists, they understand. Your landscape artists didn't get no, 100 miles a, up in the that air That is a paint big out. difference, yeah, exactly. Do you see... Uh, I have an artist friend, he is from Iraq, and he always says, uh, which is an odd thing we've been thinking about it, he always says, um, you in Europe have a vertical vision um, and we have a horizontal vision um, and it's odd because the um, Aboriginal paintings are in fact vertical from above but it's an entirely, so I, I'm now th thinking with three concepts. What does he mean by horizontal, you know, moving in towns with different senses rather than with a words eye view and a map, which we do normally in Europe. Um, and what is the horizontal view that the aboriginals, uh, the vertical view that the aboriginals employ? But I, f I find this deeply interesting, but I just wanted to say <laughs> the real <laughs> challenge is to actually paint just what one sees. <laughs> but if, if, you've got, if you've got two aboriginal artists painting this bird's eye view of country, you'll get two different paintings because each of them would paint the country from their story. Mm. Yeah. So, so, so the, the, the country doesn't have just a physical relevance, which say a geologist 
mm. or a cartographer could, or whatever, you know, the people who... Can, can I just say that the painting's only one part of the story? Yeah, yeah. You know, there's song, there's dance, yeah. there's, it's very complex. So. <coughs> Okay, we have another question to get. Jocelyn, you're, you're not trying to make trouble, are you? <laughs> I might, Rob. Um, I sometimes like to have this thought um, exercise with myself when I imagine the first moment when a decision was made by somebody about this country that wasn't locally accountable, that wasn't, you know, accountable to the other people and to the resources in this place. You know, and it might have been a decision that was made in a European parliament or um, a European armed force, or it might have been a decision made by someone bringing sheep in here where they're saying, all right, my livelihood isn't going to be about the interaction with the resources of this country. It's going to be taking the resources of this country and shipping them off somewhere else so I can get the money back and spend that and do things with it. <coughs> exercise to think about how this process has unfolded over the last quite short period of time, you know, 180 years or 150 years or so in this country, where there's been this huge scale shift in how resources and decisions and things happen and the loss of all the accountability um, to uh, each other, to the immediate resources and their consequences that you've all spoken about. And so, you know, like you say, Andreas, we do still get, have this accountability to the local resources in that we take in the oxygen and some of the water that we take in, the oxygen we take in is locally um, uh, produced and supports our cell growth, but almost everything else we take in to support our, our growth and development as people comes from outside. And, um, comes from a long way away and has led to this scale destruction ultimately of the whole natural world, you know, the, um, and the inability of us as a planet to make decisions at the scale we need to make them at in order to fix it. But it's that same process, there is another side to it, it's that same process has it's been what's allowed us to have these conversations. You know, we, we couldn't be having these conversations if we didn't have uh, iPhones or computers or libraries or um, airlines or whatever. Um, so uh, at, at the same time, you know, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that there is a plus side for the capacity of people to challenge Western thought, to even name what Western thought is, to name, you know, what, or talk about what we might see as indigenous or um, common thought. Um, but, but then the destruction also highlights this process that I think Kieran and and Paul spoke particularly to being from this place about how we get back those local accountabilities and those local connections. Mm -hmm. And um, when the neoliberal world is still so much pushing that away for Aboriginal people, has made the important connection between the individual and the government, individual and the government, nothing else is important in the way that, that government tends to see Aboriginal people's lives. But yet, Aboriginal people here in this place work so hard against that and work so hard to, to, you know, to reiterate their connection and their accountability and their taking in of the rest of us who live here. And then the two organisations that these two work for, the Alice Springs News and the Desert Park, also do so much there to, to share that and, um, and bring those accountabilities back. And lots of other people in this room do it too with like slow food movement and trying to grow things and find people water. So I guess I just wanted to <coughs> reiterate that point. Let's mm -hmm. just keep working strong on the local sustainability and bringing in of ideas, not resources so much, but ideas that will allow us to do that. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I guess I was just going to say something about um, Western thought also having that um, self critical component or self-analyzing component built in and I'll defer to the um, academics for a better understanding of that but that is very much a characteristic of Western thinking as to self-criticize 
isn't it? Yeah, well, it, it, it's got two dimensions. Um, well, one's got to do with being self-critical. The examination of conscience, they used to tell me it was when I went for the priests and when I was at school. Um, and the other side of it is that uh, comes from the Greek, uh, know thyself. Mm -hmm. And the idea there essentially is, um, at least one aspect of the idea is, it, you, you might think of it in terms of the second account of creation in uh, Genesis. Most people think there's only one account, but there's two accounts of creation in Genesis. In the second account, man is created first. And all the things are created out of man. This is uh, exactly what you're pointing to. So all the, uh, ma man is created first, and all of the, the, the chain of being is a derivation or a participation in that, that in the nature of man. So when, when the Delphic Oracle says, know thyself, she says that the idea behind it is if you do really understand yourself, you, you would know everything as well about the relationships. So I, aspects of you. Yeah, I guess I was just acknowledging that as the strength of our culture, um, that we will examine these things and think about them and, yeah, hopefully make some progress with them. Well, we made progress from feudalism to capitalism, so <laughs> that's progress. Okay, do we have any further questions? Yeah. Well, Just speak up. You're never going to get asked. Just have one question about the, um, the problem with Western thought, which could well be an oversimplification, but I'm just going to ask the question anyway. When Barack Obama addressed the Australian Parliament in 2011, he said, if there is prosperity um, without freedom, then it's another form of poverty. And he was talking about China. He was talking about a country of a billion people and how it had grown and how their community had got stronger and stronger in the last 30 years. <coughs> Given all the talk today about connectedness and mutuality, which I think the whole room feels, to what degree is it, or is it just too simple, say that the utter primacy with which individual freedom has been given in Western thought is actually the cause of a lot of problems. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, one, I think one, one, one defining feature of what now we have been calling Western thought in a, in a large sense is that freedom there is freedom separated from anything else. Mm -hmm. But there are also um, competing discourses of freedom, yeah. um, and um, which you also find within Western thought, as, for example, in Kant, the, the German philosopher, which, which where freedom is always linked to necessity, or in, in Schiller, the German um, poet and also philosopher, um, where there is no freedom out with it, which is out of this world. It is always um, freedom in relationship, which means freedom in necessity. And that for, for this particular philosopher, poet Schiller, is even the definition of beauty. That's, that's, that's necessity in freedom. That's what you, what you need to do, but you do it, you imagine it in the way you want it to do. And um, so, so I, I mean, I, 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 when you quoted Obama, I had this typical reaction of mine when I heard hear such a nice Obama quote. I was thinking, wow. Yeah, and then, cool. It, yeah, cool, <laughs> yeah, great guy. Um, but then immediately I, I knew what you were asking. Uh, that, and, and I think this, I mean, that's, that's, you, yeah, that's the, that's the, it's a battle world also, which is, which is also suppressing other accounts because um, if you, if you start to talk about mutuality or mutual transformation or even my definition of love as being myself through you being yourself you you're out of this idea of freedom and then come people and say i want my freedom and it's granted to me and i have the right to be free and um and that we're in an impasse but i mean this, this is why i love so much that i can can, can find all these principles um looking down on on biology on what is going on in an organism 
because you can, from my point of view, to seeing a cell as something which constructs itself out of the surroundings, um, you have you, you 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 can understand a cell, a living being, as a certain degree of freedom. So you don't see it as a machine, but as something which tries to construct itself out of, of, of the remainder of this world. But this freedom in, in this biological um, act of creating my identity is always dependent on, on other. So, so in this kind of biological first act of, of being free as, as, a, as an identity which is creating itself, it is always a first act of dependency. So that, but that's, the, that's the, the part we did not see, actually. And, um, and I mean, um, just, just to add one more thing, um, thing which came into my head when you were talking about this, 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 um, this um, classical gnoti te auton, the, the, the classical idea of <coughs> know yourself. There is also a competing theme to this, which is linked to this, and which, which Foucault in his late work was working on. That, that is, um, care for yourself. And care for yourself, not in the sense of hedonistic, like to do, do, do that which is the, the best for you, um, but in the sense of the, 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 the Greek um, idea of, of parisia, of, um, of being true. Care to yourself in the sense that, ye, that you can be the true and real self, which is also related not to total freedom, but to that which there is. You can only be true if there is something which you can not just invent which you are, which is your essence, which is your relatedness with others, or which is your um, dependence on the land. And, um, and uh, the interesting thing is that the, 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 the experience of being true, I'm real, now I am real, I'm just what I am, is always um, a euphoric experience. We know this, and it's a good experience. And this is, this is, this is the other side of freedom, which, which we need to, 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 we need to find, we need to, Strive for it again, to my eyes. Yeah, thanks. You, you gave me an occasion to, to <laughs> deliver on this. Sorry, I can't see for that line. So. Yeah. But I grew up here in Central Australia, and uh, adopted by Wapiti people, and um, very grateful to be in your country. You know, I'm very happy to be here. Um, what I'd like to share today is my insight from from being um, a descendant of an indigenous um, culture that, from from my my country, is we don't have language, we don't have um, law, we don't have culture up there, so. A lot of my life is, has been spent asking these questions of why, and um, what I've come to understand and learn because I've had to, to answer these questions. I've had to, I've had to ask myself the broad question of cramming what is it, twelve thousand years, practically five thousand five hundred years, into a space of one lifetime of research and understanding to comprehend um, traditionally what our culture is is um, we do, we're a sacred society. And they might say it's a secret society, but sacred, you know? And it might even stem from the definition of sacred itself. And um, stemming from my understanding of uh, Aboriginal culture and the true treasure of what this really means for European people to come here and to find us here living harmoniously with the land, with our knowledge and of understanding things, and to see that there's no buildings, there's no um, sacred monuments. I mean, we have Ayers Rock, but you know, um, we don't climb on it. Um, and uh, so the greatest treasure I think Australia has is really the oral tradition that we share as indigenous peoples. And to really understand what it is to understand this, we need to ask the elders questions and we need to go there and participate in, in, our, in the culture and to learn to become man or whatever. Uh, well, that's just one side of looking at things. Uh, the other side is um, what 
is our indigenous traditional public policy. And our traditional public policy, <coughs> when we're speaking of a sacred culture, is children's story. So, my father, God bless him, he's passed away now. He was a black, he fought really hard for our people. He knew language, he knew song and dance, and he ended up being a black best in custody. And I lived to somehow re rectify my situation in not having the chance to learn culture and, and to be able to truly understand. So I spent my life and my entire life finding out why. So in order for me to understand really why, I had to ask, well, how did, where, did, where, did, where did Western thought go wrong? Where did we disconnect from hunter-gatherer to the point that we stem into the entry of Botany Bay and and uh, the raising of the flag of, of, of the British flag at, at, um, at said location. So I've got to ask um, myself and everybody else here, obviously, uh, where does Western sport go wrong? When we think of Aboriginal culture, um, probably the best example in the world of a culture that has been um, isolated for such a long time in said location, 65,000 years or so, and in which time um, um, we kept our law strong, we kept our culture strong, and we have these policies, you know, like of, of public affairs, but nobody seems to ask us these questions, you know. Um, so this is, this is where I'm bringing my question, well not question, but a subject for reference, if you may, into the public questioning here, is if traditional Aboriginal public policy is um, children's story, and that to um, to speak in public is to have respect for the children, to have respect for women, to have respect for the place where the children play and the, and the women they, they talk, and we we don't speak mature content in the public area space. So my question, as an indigenous person, has asked this question my entire life: Where did Western thought really go wrong? The, really, the reality is that I have to ask is what's this mature subject matter being brought into, the, into our sacred place of public speaking? And to ask, answer this question, I've had, to, I've had to go back, way back, 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 till I had to assume that before um, the, the, the entrance of, of public thought and politics, there was sacred society that there was hunter-gatherer. And our greatest treasure might be a, a great example of what we once had or retained. But if I could say that maybe or suppose that the introduction of kingship and the origin of divinity really stems into this, into our public sacred place from said location at such a time way, way back where it comes and enters in our country uh, sorry for saying this, uh, really affects me and my, my people where I lose my culture, I lose my father, I lose my chance of learning everything that I ever had a chance at. All because somebody want to speak in public, our sacred place, <laughs> without even recourse or attention to political ramification of sacred oath. What is sacred oath? Well, that's what we retain as indigenous peoples in this country, is our culture, is our government. We have, we have 443 various different languages and nations, and of all those different nations, we had one class, we had one system or that, that connected every single one of these nations with all different languages, different stories from all different places, and it was man. So, <coughs> if I was to ask, what was the creation of man? Was it this kingship? Or was it um, humanity itself? Maybe the question we need to ask ourselves is what is our humanity? What does it really mean to us? What boundary are we willing to step over in order to retain our sense of gratified, gratified humanity? You know, this is my question that I ask myself every single day of my life when I have to look at this world and I have to see that this 
causality of ramification uh, permeates every facet of my reality. I don't have that recourse to learn from my father, but I have one chance to at least understand European culture. And that's one thing that I've grown up in learning. I understand what I cannot say, because I'm an initiated man, but I know also know what I can say. Because my father, he had permission from the elders to come and speak in the public setting and teach song and dance to the people, children's stories, um, beautiful stories about crocodile uh, hunting and uh, that boy, he get caught and uh, he, he, the elders, they try and tell him um, that you don't hunt in a certain place in the fishing hole. But he was too smart, he thought, oh, I might go over here and uh, get, some, get some good fish because there's good fish over here. So he'd go over there, he'd look for them fish he hunt for them, but that crocodile can get him, you know, eat him. And so when, when my, my father's doing the property at the end of, of, the, of the children's story, you see that crocodile, you grab that crocodile, you eat him, and then that boy's spirit and that, that crocodile, like, then the two dancers, they jump up and they shake their leg back. Like they're going round and round in a circle, like they're dancing with each other for eternity. You know why? Because that song was being passed on for generation to generation and we'll always remember. And um, this is one example. If I could say if, there's, if there was any possibility that indigenous people who, ha who cannot speak, who this is why we don't see um, all our um, great thinkers and, and men in the public spotlight speaking. I can speak because I know the difference in what I can say and what I cannot say. And if what I can say here is what if we did have a government at the public level that just reflected children's stories, uh, teaching children morals and education. And um, this is where <coughs> I think Western thought has gone wrong from my entire life where I've had to cram 12,000 years of understanding and learning into my lifetime. And what I have to show for it, maybe you might even look as an eternal flame. Because I understand Prometheus. This was a story, there's a very sacred story, and maybe we'll all get a chance at some point in time to talk about it. But until we can actually get over our most common dilemma, which is how do we speak in this public hemisphere, I don't think we can ever get over what, where Western thought has gone wrong. So that's my little thing. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, that's just, I haven't had to speak for a while. Yeah, I just think that what Jai has just said about you know, the story about the crocodile and the boy, that's a connection to nature, so they become connected forever. So, you know, there's a responsibility on both sides, both nature and human. And, um, yeah, very interesting, Joy. Okay. <coughs> no one's going to ask a question. Go home and have your dinner. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, sweetie.